Create Canada, how's everybody doing? Um, we're starting a little early today. Hope everybody's having a good day. It's pretty good here. And we have a speech by Poliev. We're going to watch and listen to that. And then we're going to hopefully swing right into question period. Let's get things rocking. Uh, no, no sense in waiting any longer for Pierre Poliev. Here we go. Merci beaucoup. Who's ready to axe the tax? All right, let's get Who's it going. Who's ready to build the homes? Who's ready to fix the budget? Who's ready to stop the crime? Yeah. J'allais commencer mon discours uh, en parlant de mon plan de gros bon sens, de couper taxes, impôts, bâtir des logements, réparer le budget uh, et stopper les crimes. I was going to start my speech today uh, as properly scripted by my team, talking about my common sense plan to axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget and stop the crime. But I was interrupted by the testimony I just read from our very own Prime Minister just yesterday. He said something incredible, although not so surprising. Of course, what we're investigating is whether a foreign dictatorship interfered in our democracy in multiple elections to help him win. A communist dictatorship seeking to keep in office someone who said he, he admires might, he that communist with, dictatorship. With what's going on. But his defense actually speaks for itself. The Prime Minister was asked why he didn't do anything about this interference, even though he was warned in briefing notes, is that he doesn't read briefing notes. <laughs> now, we often don't believe the things that this guy says, but I think that most Canadians would believe that defense. <laughs> I think it's plausible that Justin Trudeau doesn't read documents that come before him. Um, in fact, I think it's likely that he doesn't read things that come before him. And I think that that defense is interesting for three reasons. One, Hi, Carol, what's up? How are because you? Because the ivory tower elite. Kenny Crowman, man, what's going on? Him and his ideology Clint, what's of going concentrating on, all the power in their and money in their hands. Uh, they seem, they always tell us how wonderfully sophisticated and cosmopolitan they are how brilliant they are, and that's why they're entitled. They're experts, after all, right? Uh, th that's why they're entitled to decide for other people. Um, but yet they're prepared to support a guy who says he doesn't read. <laughs> it's like, he might be a know-nothing, but he's our know-nothing, right? <laughs> they support a guy who confuses decimals with decibels, who says budgets balance themselves, even when they never do. <laughs> who says he doesn't think much about monetary policy, admits he's not very good with numbers, advises Canadians to pay for their tuition and their home renovations on their credit card. And this is the bright light, the genius, that they believe should be able to run the lives of, of mechanics who are able to take apart an engine and put it back together with blindfolds on. That, that, that the single mom hey, who Joan, what's up? How are you? her budget what's on up, a minimum wage salary needs advice on budgeting from the guy who can't budget uh, for himself. Th that is the ultimate irony of the elitism is that these so pseudo-intellectuals vest all their faith in this guy of all people. The second thing that's so interesting, and this came up, by the way, in his defense on another scandal, when he had accepted What's up, angry a Canadian? quarter How million dollar free vacation from someone who had met with him asking for, and later received, a $15 million grant from his government. The kind of uh, cronyism that would get a small town mayor put in jail. But the defense the Prime Minister gave at the time was that in the meeting, he didn't actually, he, he, it wasn't, he wasn't substantially important because he actually doesn't run the government. He's a ceremonial figurehead. 
and therefore he didn't have any actual power over the government he heads to give the individual what he was asking for in exchange for that famous free vacation. Even though, in the Prime Minister's own Open and Accountability Guide, the machinery of government, and that's a quote, is the exclusive responsibility of the Prime Minister, which brings me to the second reason why his I don't read my briefing notes defense is so interesting. And it is this, he wants all the power and none of the responsibility. He literally wants to control the entire economy. He wants to nationalize large industries with monstrous taxpayer-funded subsidies, and yet he, he, he wants to print $600 billion without having any responsibility for the resulting inflation. He wants to What's up? increase the cost of government without taking any of the blame for the resulting interest payments that households must pay on their own debt after he drove up the rates. He wants none of the responsibility for the fact that we have the slowest economic growth in the OECD over the next five years and over the next 35 years after he promised all this spending was going to stimulate the contrary. He wants to have total control over what you can see and say online to protect us all from these dangerous forces that might influence our thinking if we are not protected by the angels in the government. And yet, when there is actually a risk of manipulation by hostile and malicious actors like, say, a communist regime in Beijing, he can't even take the responsibility of reading his briefing notes. This is the irony, the great irony of his leadership, and one of the reasons why I think he's succeeded in doubling housing costs, giving us the worst inflation in 40 years, sending 2 million people to the food banks, 8,000 people signing up for a Facebook group called the Dumpster Diving Network because they now have to eat out of a garbage can after he drove food prices rising with his carbon tax. He wants to control every aspect of your life, and then when he ruins your life, he wants to take none of the responsibility for the ruin that he caused. And the third reason why this testimony and this entire scandal is so consequential and indicative is why the hell did a dictatorship, a communist dictatorship, on the other side of the world, consider it such a, a, a strategic imperative to keep this guy as prime minister. What was their motive? Why did they believe that they would be better off by having him as our prime minister in at least two elections where they intervened to help him win? Why? Because he's good for Canada? Or is it because he admires their basic Chinese communist dictatorship? He admits that he admires Fidel Castro and his policy agenda would seem to point in that direction. And that direction is the topic of my speech today because it is a radical departure from the hey, common nature, what's up? sense Good to see you. Canadian way. And if you want to know about that common sense Canadian way, take a walk in the town centre of Saskatoon. Why? Anybody from Saskatoon here? Well, there's two reasons why you should do that. One, because, of course, Saskatoon is my mother's hometown, so it's, it's a historic place uh, um, <laughs> and a very important place. And the second reason is that you will see a beautiful pair of statues together of a paper boy named John Diefenbaker selling a newspaper to Wilfrid Laurier. Laurier was in Saskatoon on July 29th, uh, sorry, excuse me, July 29th, 1910. Sorry, I didn't bring my notes, just like Justin, I don't read, so I, if I am... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Deef, and Deef is out on the streets selling newspapers, and along comes a prime minister who that day was laying a cornerstone at a college uh, of the University of Saskatchewan, and... D D Laurier actually buys a newspaper What's up, Aaron Young? Good from to see this you, man. kid, gives him 25 cents. By the way, 
That was before just inflation, when 25 cents was a lot of money. And uh, so the two of them talk for a little while. I think Laurier later, later in the day recounted this conversation with this young whippersnapper. And before the conversation could come to an end, Deef said, being a good conservative, said to himself, I'm not making any sales right now, I've got to wrap this up. He said, sorry, Prime Minister, but I can't waste any more time with you. I have more newspapers to sell. <laughs> but there you had a future Prime Minister who was then a paper boy. I was a paper boy too, by the way. Um, and um, a current Prime Minister. And you think, those, these two guys have nothing in common. One was a liberal, the other was a conservative. The other was a French Catholic. The other was a English-speaking Baptist. One was a Quebecer, the other was a prairie boy. They, their terms were separated by almost half a century. But in fact, they had plenty in common. They both believed in the common wisdom and the common sense of the common people. When Laurier was asked, what is Canada's nationality? Now, in most places, a leader in that time would have defined nationality based on religion, ethnicity, or some other demarcation line of the sort. But he could do no, no such thing because even back then, over a century ago, we were all mixed up, right? We had, of course, the first peoples. We had the French, the English, the Scots, the Irish. Asian immigrants were already starting to arrive on our shores, so we couldn't define ourselves by ethnicity. We had, we had Catholic and Protestant, and the arrival of new religions, uh, to, new from a North American point of view, to our continent and to our country. And so he defined Canada and its nationality the following way. He said, Canada is free, and freedom is its nationality. Now, <laughs> Diefenbaker would later sign the Bill of Rights, and on it, he would write, I am a Canadian, a free Canadian. Hey, M, what's up? How are you? Free Good to, to speak you. without fear. Free to worship God in my own way. Free to stand for what I think right. Free to oppose what I believe wrong. This heritage of freedom I pledge to uphold for myself and all of mankind. Both of them believed in our ancient liberties. Liberties that we had inherited and that had been passed down over 800 years from 1215, the Magna Carta, all the way to then and to now. Liberties that they believed, for, for which they were the custodians. They were simply, they were not the owners of that liberty, they were simply the guardians whose job it was to take the torch and pass it on, as Edmund Burke explained, a contract between- What's up, Stephen the, Phillips, good to see yet, you. The, the, the dead, the living, and the yet to be born. They understood, thank you very much, Roy. Dr. Roy gave me a round of applause there. Uh, thank you, Roy. Speaking of nonpartisanship, I'll be conservative in my remarks if you be liberal in your applause, all right? Um, but thank you, Dr. Roy. And they understood, they weren't there to reinvent the universe. They didn't, thought, they didn't think that they were the living embodiment of God, that they could engineer humans and populations and re recreate some brave new world. They were here to inherit the great gifts that ancestors before them had passed down. And they understood that Canada wasn't perfect, just as we look back at our history today and acknowledge it wasn't perfect. And you know what though? Whenever we have gone wrong, it is because we have gotten away from those basic principles of human freedom and in favored too much state coercion and control, not the other way around. Now that, that common sense consensus guided our country for its first hundred years. It went into hibernation between about 1967 and 1984. And then it reawoke, it reawakened uh, in, uh, the, with the election of the great Brian Mulroney, uh, who reversed the course of the previous decade and a half, of course he, in he inherited the country in a total mess. 
high unemployment and inflation, interest rates were in the double digits. The suicide rate had reached its highest level in Canadian history the year before, as so many people were losing their homes and their jobs as a direct result of excessive government control uh, and uh, uh, coercion and the, the absolutely insane policies that had drowned our country in debt. And so Brian Mulroney set out in 1984 to reduce the size of the state, to get rid of unnecessary red tape and regulations, to privatize 23 crown corporations, to bring us into an operating surplus. We did have an actual deficit that was entirely the interest payments on Pierre Elliott Trudeau's debt, but the operating balance of the government was positive. He signed the biggest and most successful free trade agreement in Canadian history. And if you think I just want to praise him because he was on the blue team, I will say that the subsequent Chrétien and Martin governments carried on and in fact accentuated all of his policies. Not only did they not reverse free trade or free markets or re-regulate or renationalize, they actually continued privatizing, continued saving money for the government. And if we can be even more nonpartisan about it, we have to give Jean Chrétien What's up, Fern? credit How are you? cut the CBC, right? Um, and uh, that was a great idea. And, and then we had, of course, uh, the great Stephen Harper, who lowered taxes further by freeing up more of our people, people's paychecks uh, so that they could spend those, that, that money What's themselves, up, they could be rewarded. I'm just not sure if I said hello. I he saw you earlier. For free I know enterprise I typed it. even further and kept our country, with the exception of the great global recession, at or close to a balanced budget where it remained until 2015. This was the common sense Canadian consensus, the common sense Canadian way that believed in hard work, self-reliance, free markets, free trade, that there should be a social safety net to do for people what they could not do for themselves. The government should genuinely be, fear, be there for the least fortunate among us and that we should give them the opportunity to climb up the ladder of life. This was the consensus, but at the same time, the consensus rejected the notion that government should control what you think, what you believe, how your money should be spent. It believed that budgets should, unless in exceptional circumstances, be balanced and debt should be limited so that our precious public resources could go to nurses and doctors and soldiers. Well, welcome not Ingrid and Charlie. Uh, and welcome bonders. to the channel. It's fun here. I think now, you'll like Justin it. Trudeau Good came to see you. in 2015. Now, to be clear, a lot of people say that he's gone too far, that he took liberalism in the wrong, not just far, but in an extreme direction. I disagree, because what Justin Trudeau has done is not only to break with the common sense Canadian consensus, it's to break with liberalism himself, itself. Liberals used to believe in laissez-faire, let people make their own decisions and live their own lives. Different strokes for different folks. Remember that? Hey, Lightning Rod, how are you today? More or less think for themselves, decide for themselves, and live their lives in their own way, as Pierre Elliott Trudeau famously plagiarized when he said that the government had no place in the bedrooms of the nation. Now, his son wants the government to be in every room of your house and your business and your wallet, and What's your up, bank account, Canada? How are and you? your internet Good account. Good to see you. He wants to be everywhere always. See, the thing is, it's not that Justin Trudeau is too liberal. It's that he's not liberal at all. He is deeply, deeply illiberal. It's getting pretty interesting right here. Wow. Hey, Sheila, what's going on? How are you he today, uses girl? The Good to see you. Soft blue eyes and fluffy hair and fancy socks, and more importantly, the historic brand of the Liberal Party built up by such great leaders as Laurier and many more who followed him as a cover for what is a radical departure from the Canadian way. A radical departure that sees in every way. What up, True Blue? Good day, sir. How are you, brother? made small. So that the government can Mike Tremblay, made, you're blowing made. me away here. He dis and we see the, the consequences of this. You see, even if he were competent, it is not possible for any one person 
to run 40 million other people. It is simply not possible. Humans are far too complicated, their interactions far too numerous for one central authority, no matter how wise and virtuous it claims to be, to make all the decisions for them. It has to leave them to make as many decisions as possible for themselves. Worse yet, so when you have the only thing worse than having some all-knowing elite to try to control everybody's life is to have someone doing that when he doesn't even read his briefing notes, <laughs> right? <laughs> because it's not only will he overrule the common sense of the common people, but he will do it badly, as he has done, and hence the consequences that we see uh, with uh, today, 76% of Canadians telling pollsters, 76% of folks who don't yet own a home, believe they never will. This would have been unimaginable eight years ago. Unimaginable. It would have been unimaginable eight years ago, before Justin Trudeau, to think that not only would he pass a law to control what you can see and say on the internet, but the, the, he would then pat, put forward another law which could put you under house arrest or a peace bond under suspicion Way of to go, Dive Crew Canada, you're amazing. you might Thank say you. in the future. You know, this guy, if he read, if he had read 1984, he would have thought it was an instruction manual <laughs> and not a warning. <laughs> This is a pretty fun speech, I think. Most of the politics is, is hard to watch. There is an of common sense across the country. Yes, I think it was just yesterday or the day before, General Hillier said that he, the thing he hears the most often when he walks around the streets of this country is, this is not Canada. We don't recognize this place. And that's what I hear from fifth, everything from fifth generation Canadians to uh, immigrants who arrived here 10 years ago, they say, my God, what happened to this country in the last eight years? Can you imagine if you had been in a coma in 2015 and woke up to this nightmare, uh, how unfamiliar it would all seem? But the good news, my friends, is that life was not like this before Justin Trudeau, and it won't be like this after he's gone. Our common sense plan may seem simple because it is all the greatest things in life are simple. Comple complexity is the last refuge of the scoundrel. So let's get down to the simple plan that will work, the simple principles that have always worked. We will ax the tax to bring down the cost of heat, gas, and groceries, and we will cut income taxes so that hard work actually pays off again, and people can bring home the benefits of their hard work. Somebody's and freaking we out. will say here and everywhere, that we will ax the tax. Who in this room is ready to ax the tax? Sounds like somebody ax is. Ax the tax. Ax there she the goes. Tax. Ax the tax. Ax the tax. That's our friend Lightning Rod being tossed out. <laughs> ax the tax. Just teasing Lightning Rod. Ax the tax. Ax the tax. Ax the tax. <laughs> Fantastic. We have, whenever I, I announce my plan to ax the tax, there's such an outburst of enthusiasm <laughs> that uh, just uncontrollable. Um, it's a frenzy, really. Um, and then further compound that with lower income taxes to reward hard work. Some people find these ideas so revolutionary <laughs> after eight years of being broke that they can't contain their enthusiasm. Um, but. Uh, that's a good thing. We need to have some enthusiasm. I think the conservative movement is very enthusiastic these days. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> that the, the uh, deter, our determination to cut taxes is not just about having, you know, a price discount that could be advertised in a dollar store flyer. It's not just about saving pennies here and there. It's about a fundamental philosophical disagreement. We believe that a dollar in the hands of the person who earned it 
is always more powerful than in the hands of the politician who taxed it. This is a philosophical disagreement that I believe that the welder who can fuse together metals with, with his bare hands is more, has more brain power in how to direct his dollar than the guy who doesn't read his briefing notes, right? And so that is the fundamental philosophical difference when we talk about cutting taxes. And it, it goes further to energy. There's a fundamental philosophical difference there as well. I believe that we should fight to protect our environment and combat climate change with technology and not taxes. I believe in lowering the cost of alternatives rather than raising the cost of traditional energy we still need. I believe in green lighting green projects. Trudeau believes in putting stop signs in front of our workers. And here's the key. I believe in bringing home powerful paychecks for our people rather than what he believes, which is to drive away production into the hands of the dirty dictators. I believe in bringing it home, in other words. So, if you doubt that this is the disagreement, look at every form of energy and transportation Trudeau's fanatical environment minister has opposed. He's obviously against Canadian oil and gas while he strongly supports coal burning in China and oil production in the Middle East. Uh, he's like Mark Carney that way. Carney's against pipelines in Western Canada at the same time as he sits uh, in the executive towers of a company that bought pipelines in Brazil and the Middle East, right? They're, they're strongly in favor of foreign petroleum interests, but strongly against our workers right here in Canada. Uh, that, that is the view of Justin Trudeau and his successor, his incoming uh, successor, Carbon Tax Carney. They agree on that much. And, but furthermore, th but his fanatical environment minister has been in the past against nuclear. He's against nuclear. So we, we, take, we, we shut down nuclear, then half the lights in this room go out right now. As more than half of the electricity in this province of Ontario actually comes from nuclear. Common sense conservatives understand that the best way to add zero emitting baseload electricity across our country is by expanding and safely approving can-do reactors and small modular reactors. We're going to unleash the power of our atoms for, free, for clean and low-cost energy for our people. Then you've got... And then you've got the minerals of electrification. See, Trudeau wants to subsidize the assembly of foreign raw materials and then send them in packets to the United States where they can be added to electric cars, even though we have those raw materials right here in Canada. We have the sixth biggest supply of lithium anywhere on Earth, but we don't mine any of it because it takes 18 years to get a mine approved, as long as 25 years if you uh, listen to the Government of Canada's own website. So we import lithium that is mined in Chile and refined, burning coal in China so that liberal elites can feel great about themselves driving electric cars that were made burning coal when we could have been powering those mines with clean Canadian energy and driving clean Canadian and powerful paychecks for our people. When I'm Prime Minister, we will repeal the unconstitutional Bill C-69 so that we can approve mines in 18 months rather than 18 years and bring home the production to our country. Yep. Ensuite, il y a des, des, des barrages hydroélectriques Le le, um, Gilbo, Stephen, Stephen Gilbo veut un double processus pour retarder la construction des barrages hydroélectriques dont le Québec a besoin pour fournir de l'électricité verte dans sa province. Un gouvernement poilier va éliminer le doublement, le, le doublement d'approbation appro, pour qu'on puisse ramener la production hydroélectrique au Québec et à travers le Canada. He wants to double 
the, the reapproval process for hydroelectric dams that will slow the, their, their construction down by three more years, common sense conservatives, will get rid of double processes. We'll have one review and one approval for one project so that we can build more hydroelectric dams in Quebec and right across the country. We're furthermore going to unleash the power of natural gas. We have 1,300 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. So get the numbers that came out from National Bank. National Bank pointed out that Canada has 0.7 billion tons of emissions. India will be adding many billions of emissions as a result of their use of coal fire. If Canada were to liquefy and export its natural gas to allow India to replace half of its future coal-fired electricity with clean Canadian gas, What's up, Dan? What's up, Patty? How are you guys we today? Good to see you. We global emissions by 2.5 billion tons. That's three times more than the entire Canadian economy emits in a year. When I'm Prime Minister, we will... By the way, we have the ability to do this. We have the shortest shipping distance to both Asia and to Europe. We have the cold weather that makes liquefaction 25% cheaper. We have clean hydroelectricity in Quebec. British Columbia and Newfoundland and Labrador, which can power that liquefaction. Look at the incredible Squamish people who are now building a liquefaction plant. It took them 13 years to get federal approval to do it. But they're cleaning up a dirty old pulp, pulp and paper mill that had left the place totally contaminated, from which First Nations people were banned from even working as janitors. Hey, and Jason now Smith, they're how are working you? as executives and owners and a future zero-emitting natural gas liquefaction plant that will be good for the earth and that will bring home powerful paychecks for their people and our country. We're going to see a lot more of that when I'm Prime Minister. But it takes getting rid of the gatekeepers. We will get rid of the federal gatekeepers to allow these projects to go ahead. And we will do so when it comes to housing as well. After eight years of Trudeau, housing costs have doubled. In fact, it now takes uh, as long as 120 years for someone to pay off their mortgage as a result of the interest rate hikes on the already high home prices that Trudeau said would never happen. This is not normal. It is not happening anywhere else in the world to the same degree. Our housing costs under Trudeau have risen outpaced incomes 40% faster than the OECD average. In fact, we have the second worst housing affordability problem over the last eight years among the 40 OECD countries, and by far the worst in the G7. And the reason is we have the fewest homes. We have the fewest homes, even though we have by far the most land, the most lumber, and we spend the largest share of our GDP of any OECD country on housing and residential construction. The average OECD country spends 4% of their GDP on residential construction. We spend 9 and yet we have the fewest homes. Why? Gatekeepers. Government gatekeepers block the construction and prevent housing from getting built. My common sense plan is to get the, the municipal and local gatekeepers out of the way by requiring they permit 15% more housing completions per year or they will lose their federal funding their federal infrastructure money. That if they beat the target, they'll get a bonus. If they miss the target, they will pay a fine. They will be required to permit high-density housing around every transit station. We will sell off 6,000 federal buildings and thousands of acres of federal land and convert those buildings into homes for our people. And nothing warms my heart more than the thought of a beautiful family pulling up in their U-Haul to move into their wonderful new home in the former headquarters of the CBC. <laughs> Hi, Tina. How are you? Good afternoon. Good to see you. We'll get rid of the carbon tax to lower the cost of transporting building, building materials. We'll back the trades. We'll bring in tax fairness for traveling trades workers, and we'll make sure that there is federally uh, assisted Red Seal content that provinces can choose to adopt so our kids can start their apprenticeships before they're even out of high school, because we need more boots, not more suits, if we're going to build the homes of the future. And we're going to build those homes in safe neighborhoods by stopping the crime. We're going to stop the crime by reversing everything that caused the crime. Remember, Justin Trudeau and the experts told us that if we just let violent criminals 
repeat offenders out of jail earlier, then they would be, their hearts would be warmed and they would no longer do crime. Uh, they would be completely rehabilitated by, by having not served any time behind bars. In that 30 minutes while they were in a, being arraigned before getting automatic bail, uh, their, their hearts would be uh, completely transformed, we were told, by these brilliant experts who were quoted endlessly in the media. By the way, don't you think that when the media quotes an expert, it should be a journalistic practice to one, Note whether that so-called expert has a financial interest in the pol policy they're advancing, and two, how many times they've been wrong in the past, right? Uh, so if you're wrong all the time, you're not much of an expert. Well, they were definitely wrong on crime, because under the previous Conservative government, we brought in uh, tougher sentences for the worst violent offenders, and what happened? Violent crime went down 25%, and you know what else went down? incarcerations. We had fewer people in jail after all the experts told us we'd have to build new ones. Why? Because the people we locked up were coming in and out anyway. They were like, it was like the whole Hotel California for them. They were checking out but never leaving. They were going back. We had to reserve a bed for them no matter what. So we thought it would be better if we just left them there so that they couldn't punctuate their sentences by bat baseball batting someone over the head in the streets. We kept them in jail, and the, the softer criminals, well, we scared the hell out of them, so they went away. Now, if this seems like simplistic thinking, look at the stats. It actually worked. So you can, you can turn to the professors, uh, the liberal professors, who say otherwise, but it actually brought crime down. And since Trudeau brought in C-83, that meant house arrest for career car thieves, they can sit in their living room and watch Netflix during their sentence or play Grand Theft Auto um, <laughs> and then go back out and steal another car, right? Car thefts are up 200%. There's new, there's 40, there's a car stolen every 40 minutes in Brampton. Since he brought in C-75, the automatic bail law, violent crime is up over 32%. That was as of 2022. Wait till the 23 numbers come out. And since he banned hunting rifles and went after lawful sport shooters and at the same time removed criminal uh, mandatory minimums for gun criminals, the number of shootings in Canada has gone up by 100%. So we're going to reverse all that. We're going to bring in jail, not bail. No more house arrests for car thieves. We're going to let our licensed, law-abiding, trained and tested sport shooters and hunters keep their property while throwing the gun criminals in jail and securing our ports and our borders. Common sense. Common sense. Common sense means giving people back control of their lives, means allowing them to make their own decisions with their own money, means allowing them to express their own opinions and their own values, and teach their kids their values on all matters, including on sexuality and gender. That kind of freedom is what Canadians have always come to expect. It is what has always worked. And so we will repeal the censorship laws, C-11. We will require university campuses implement a uh, respect for section hey gang <clears throat> sorry to interrupt um but just so that everybody does know let's get the likes going and as soon as his speech is over we're dropping right into question period we're all queued up so we'll just let uh, pierre finish he's got about three or four minutes left then we'll be dropping straight into question period um let's get back to pierre charter rights of free expression as a condition of getting federal funding if you want to If you want, if you don't like Jordan Peterson, fine. Try debating him for once, because you can't shut him down. You can't shut down people you disagree with. You have to have open and honest debate, which has always been the Canadian way. We will ban the terrorist group, the IRGC. We will stand up for our Jewish friends and neighbors who have been mercilessly targeted with anti-Semitism. And we will cut back on foreign aid to dictators, terrorists, and multinational bureaucracies, and we will put that money right back into rebuilding our military so that our soldiers, our sailors, and airmen can stand on guard for all of us.
Good day, Mr. Pickles. What's up? FYMM, good day. How are you? We're going to defund all the terrorist groups and all the international dictators. We're going to bring our money home for our people and, and stand up for our people and stand up against the dictators in Venezuela. They're going to be selling less oil because we're going to be selling good, ethical Canadian products onto the world market. Libertad. Some people here from Venezuela, some people here from every part of the world, from originally from Iran, the wonderful Persian community. Where else? Brazil, Israel, God bless Israel. Where, what else? Cuba, uh, Colombia, wow. Saskatoon, most important of all, Saskatoon. The greatest place on earth. But no matter where you're from, wouldn't you all agree Hey Cicely, it what's up? Like we're all along. Red Rose, how are you today? We're all, we're all a long way from home. We're all a long way from the country that we knew and still love. But I'm here today to paint the picture of hope and home. It's the picture of parents who wake up in the morning and provide their kids with a good, healthy breakfast that they know they can afford, before sending them safely, skipping down the street to school. No fear that their kids will be abducted or harmed, and that when they get to school, they'll learn about reading, writing, arithmetic, and history. Hello, Fair V. What's going on? Good to see you. It's the picture of those parents getting into their cars and going off to work. Maybe the wife works in the energy sector, maximizing great Canadian energy while bringing home a powerful paycheck. Maybe her husband swings a hammer, banging nails to build beautiful and affordable homes for some other family to live in. And maybe as they drive to pick up their kids, they pass a cenotaph to see local legionnaires sweeping away debris and planting fresh flowers in honor of our heroes. And when they bring their kids home and finish squabbling with them to get them to bed, and they sit down at the kitchen table, secure that they can afford their home and their life, that they're safe in their community, their eyes meet in a way that can only say, we made it. The promise was kept. Because after it all, after all the hard work, we are home. These are our people. These are our people. That is our country. This is our home. Your home, my home, our home. Let's bring it home. FYMM, thank you, very much. Thank you so much. God bless Canada. Thank you. All right, guys. So I think that we do have uh, some question period ready to go. Let's take a peek and see what we can find. Kaya compares both rental cars and car sharing sites to find you. Well, we're coming close. We've got seconds left. Here we go. Board, most recently working with the TDSB Center for Excellent for Black And again, now I think we're probably 10 minutes, to eight minutes out from question period. They were late starting yesterday. He grew up in the we'll Melbourne see. area and will be remembered as a beloved teacher at several middle schools across the world. We'll see what they're saying in the statements for now. As a teacher, he focused on making the classroom experience more culturally relevant to black students. He started clubs, coached sports, and served as a role model to thousands of teenagers in Scarborough. My condolences go out to Jay's family, including his mother, Senator Paulette Sr., and his father, Ron Williams. He will truly be missed. The Honourable Member from Winnipeg South Centre. Mr. Speaker, today marks World hey, Sandy, Awareness Day. 
In Canada alone, more than 100,000 people live with the disease. Hundreds of thousands more Canadians who are the friends, family and caregivers of those living with Parkinson's are deeply impacted too. Recently, my own family suffered a great loss with the passing of my uncle Robert, my dad's brother, following a 20-year-long courageous battle with Parkinson's. Last week, my colleague, the member from Milton and I, joined his dad Joe, my cousin David, Tim Hag of U-Turn Parkinson's, Kyle Connor of the Winnipeg Jets and others to raise awareness as the Jets played in front of a sold-out home crowd. Thanks in large part to the leadership of Kevin Donnelly and Mark Chipman from the Jets organization, nearly $100,000 was raised at that game to help U-Turn Parkinson's deliver services with a focus on physical activity to support those impacted. I am proud that U-Turn Parkinson's operates in my riding of Winnipeg South Centre. I am incredibly grateful to the Winnipeg Jets and people like Adam's dad Joe and my uncle Robert for their courage and commitment to ensuring more Canadians learn about this debilitating disease. Thank you. The Honourable member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Mr. Speaker, as members of this House, we're all given the remarkable oh gift goodness. of having Cheryl our words Glantz got quite a voice. Time. I believe the highest honour we can bestow upon someone is to say their name in this House. I rise today to speak of my dear friend and longest serving staff member, Malcolm Montgomery, who passed away in November after 31 years of service to Parliament. He was my first campaign chair and a big reason a riding held by Liberals for over 80 years fell to the upstart of the Canadian Alliance. Malcolm put in long hours and put up with a demanding boss because he was filled with passion. He was passionate about politics, policy, and parliament. He was passionate about Canada, Canadians, our history. He was passionate about his community, his friends, and above all, his family. His wife, Debbie, his children, Gord, Cameron, and Neil. To meet Malcolm was up, to experience Kurt? What's the up, full Scott? force of his enthusiasm James for Sherwood, what's Malcolm, going on? while you're no longer with us here, this house will remember you eternally. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Milton. Ever since my dad Joe's Parkinson's diagnosis, he's made it his personal mission to improve the lives of Canadians living with Parkinson's disease. And when he moved to Winnipeg, he met the legendary Tim Hag from U-Turn. They use physical activity pro programs to improve the daily lives of people living with Parkinson's disease. My dad's also a huge Winnipeg Jets fan, and it turns out the Jets' top scorer, Kyle Connor, also has a family connection to Parkinson's disease. So through the leadership of Kyle, Kevin Donnelly, Mark Chipman, and everyone at True North Sports and Entertainment, the Winnipeg Jets supported U-Turn with their 50-50 raffle draw last week. I was able to join with my colleague, the MP from Winnipeg South Centre, to watch the Jets clinch their playoff spot, and my buddy even lent me his favourite Timo Solani jersey, and participated in the check presentation guy orange, about what's up? How are you today? to you turn Parkinson's. So today I'm wishing everybody in the PD community a productive and happy World Parkinson's Day and I hope the advocacy continues throughout April. To Tim Hag and U-Turn, thanks for everything that you do for people living with Parkinson's and to the Jets, thanks for being awesome corporate sports citizens and good luck in the playoffs. The Honourable Member for Bose. Mr. Speaker, after eight years, the Bloc Liberal Costly Coalition is not worth the cost. They continue to show their contempt for farmers by radically increasing the carbon tax and by voting to amend our common sense bill, C-234. From the beginning, this government has shown Canadians that agriculture just isn't a priority for them. You know, for me, it's very simple. No farmers, no food. Farmers are being hurt by an ever-increasing carbon tax. It hurts their ability to heat their buildings, dry their grain, and feed our cities. Government taxes and regulations are to blame. Carbon pricing in Quebec adds to the burden of expenses that producers must bear. As we saw in the Journal de Montréal this morning, unfortunately it's not just the carbon tax that's crushing our farmers, it's also this government's inaction when it comes to improving support programs for farmers. The Conservatives will continue to fight for farmers and will start with uh, supporting the passage of Bill C-234 in its original form to lower the cost of food and keep our farmers in business. The Honourable Member from Saskatoon Greenwood. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. This government just slapped Canadians with a 23% carbon tax increase on April 1st. They did this while food banks are servicing record number of hungry Canadians and farmers are struggling to keep up with crippling taxes. This government needs to pass Bill C-234 in its original form to remove the carbon tax on farmers to help bring down the cost of food 
for all Canadians. Conservatives have sent a letter to the Prime Minister with three demands to fix the budget. Common sense Conservatives will not agree to support the budget unless Liberals axe the tax, build homes and cap spending with dollar-for-dollar dollar rule to bring down the interest rates and inflation. The government must find in-dollar savings for every dollar of spending. This Prime Minister is not worth the cost. The Honourable Member from Labrador. Mr. Speaker, as you know, I'm a proud Labradorian and Canadian, and this year marks a significant milestone as we pay tribute to the Labrador flag. It's 50 years no legacy, a testament to our shared identity and resilience as Labradorians. It is with deep appreciation we commend Michael and Patricia Martin of Cartwright Labrador, who 50 years ago had innovation and foresight to create the enduring symbol of Labrador pride. Since its inception, the Labrador flag has transcended, transcended boundaries, embodying unity, remembrance, and celebration of Labradorians across the globe. Its iconic design and vibrant colors serve as a constant reminder of our collective heritage and the unwavering spirit of Labradorians. So today, we rejoice in 50 years of the Labrador flag. Labradorians join me in thanking Pat and Mike Martin for this wonderful gift and to say, fly the Labrador flag with pride. Yeah. The Honourable Member from Churchill, Kiratini, ASCII. The nightmare in Gaza continues. Over 33 Palestinians mm. have been killed. Over 14,500 children. Families have gathered e for Eid. They've gathered in the rubble, in hunger, mourning their loved ones who've been killed. Just last week, we were horrified by Israel's killing of seven workers with World Central Kitchen, including one Canadian. More than 200 aid workers have been killed by Israel. It is clear the Netanyahu far-right government will continue the killing in large part because of the complicity and the empty words of countries like ours. We are witnessing a dystopian nightmare that is all too real. AI drones, cold-blooded calculations of how many innocent civilians it's okay to kill at one time. And now we hear former Prime Minister Harper heads up one of these AI firms used by Israel. We're also hearing about Canadian tax-deductible charities that are fueling the war on Gaza. Canada must end its complicity on all fronts. It starts with recognizing Palestine as a state, including full membership at the UN, bringing in a real two-way arms embargo. It means taking a stand against genocide and standing up for peace and justice. The Honourable Member for Cynthia saint pagot Mr. Speaker, Quebec places a strong value on its relationship with Taiwan, and last December we were able to highlight the opening of an office in Montreal, which will undoubtedly facilitate exchanges between this fascinating nation, which is particularly keen on technology, particularly semiconductors, and uh, our metropolis, which a great independence-minded premier, Bernard Landry, saw as being a future pole in this same field. The Bloc Québécois unreservedly supports Taiwan's entry into the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Although we have and continue to have, we've had and continue to have reservations about the content of this massive trade agreement, any nation wishing to be part of an agreement of this nature should be able to do so, so long as it meets the membership criteria. Another great uh, uh, independence-minded Quebec Premier, Jacques Parizeau, was fond of saying that the size of a country didn't matter as long as it was part of a large market. This little island will be an invaluable asset in the global supply chain. It's a win-win situation. The Honourable Member from North Orkanagan, Sushwap. Mr. Speaker, after eight years, this Prime Minister has shamelessly delivered record oh, high no deficits, Arnold, huh? driving up inflation and causing sky-high interest rates. His government has doubled rent, mortgage payments and down payments. Food banks received a record $2 million in a single month last year, and a million more are expected to use food banks this year. He has added more to the national debt than all previous Prime Ministers combined. While life has gotten worse for Canadians, this PM is spending more than ever. Now a leading economist says that rate cuts may be delayed because of high government spending. We saw that this week when the Bank of Canada held its rate in efforts to maintain its policy of quantitative tightening. 
Canadians are saying this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Will the Prime Minister cap his spending with dollar for dollar rule and bring down interest rates and inflation, or will he continue to make Canadians pay for his failures? Well. Shooting the dirty local Mellard Good was the Honourable Member right for Laval Les Îles. Mr. Speaker. Richard Ibrahim, with the help of Nicolas Abou Faisal, who is president of the Gathering of Industrialists in Zalé and the Becca, are both perfect examples of humanitarian service in their country. These are men who have done great work for the environment. They've planted 128,000 trees, Mr. Speaker, to protect the environment, and they will continue to plant more. Richard Ibrahim and Mr and Nicolas Abou Faisal are philanthropists who work to further humanitarian aid. They support widows and orphans. They pay the hospital bills for the underprivileged and they offer medical equipment to regional hospitals who help those who need it most, most without having to pay. Their creative and altruistic spirit has made them known. For Canada, Lebanon, I, I thank both of them. Thank you. What the? Come on. Questions or how? Oral right, questions. Here we go. The Honorable Member from Thornhill. Oh, my goodness. We've got Lansman kicking it off. No pull yet, I guess. We already know that the Prime Minister is not worth the cost, and after eight years, this Prime Minister is no longer even listening to Canadians. A 23% carbon tax hike in the face of Canadians who can't afford to eat. Yesterday, this House passed a Conservative common sense motion calling on him to convene an emergency televised carbon tax meeting with all 14 premiers. The Prime Minister is hiding, but maybe someone over there can tell us what day will the televised carbon tax meeting be. The Honourable Government House Leader. Speaker, today we are debating Bill C-50, the Sustainable Jobs Act, which the Royal Bank of Canada says there are 400,000 of to come to Canadians if we were just to unlock the kind of prosperity envisaged in this very progressive piece of legislation. Instead, the Conservatives put forward 20,000 amendments generated by wow. artificial intelligence. The Robo Caucus needs to stop its robo work with its robo amendments and stop gatekeeping the opportunities that are coming to Canadians. Right Nowhere man, how are you today? Can we in the Philippines? What's up? It's false and that wasn't an answer. Canadians need relief and not more liberal taxes. 70% of Canadians are now saying so. One in 10 people in Toronto are now relying on a food bank and more than half of Canadians are $200 away from missing their bills. If they aren't going to listen to Canadians, if they aren't going to give us a date, perhaps the, uh, the member can tell us what channel will the carbon tax meeting be on. <laughs> The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, the channel they should be plugged in, I don't know what it is, but it is the reality channel. Because back here in the real world, Doesn't there are real sense. jobs at stake, there are real opportunities at stake, there is affordability at stake, and these members, the Robo Caucus, with their Robo Amendments, in the way of opportunity and the way of progress and clean technology in this country, they need to get out of the way, stop the gatekeeping, let Canadians create the wealth that we yeah, need to yeah. succeed. The Honourable What's up, T.O.? How are you doing Hill. today? Good to see you. Once again, he didn't answer go. the question, and I'm not really sure what that was, but if he won't listen to Canadians, and they won't listen to their NDP caucus, the Prime Minister won't listen to his successor, Mark Carney, who also wants him to meet with Premiers. They won't give us a date. They won't give us a time. They won't tell us what channel to watch. The Prime Minister won't even show up here and answer to this motion. The Prime Minister is being defiant when Canadians are lining up at food banks in record numbers. What are you covering for? Rent's been sharp today, guys. 
Is it going to be McKinnon again? The Treasury Board. Oh no, even worse. Has repeatedly said he is all ears. If there is a better plan, put it on the table. Premier Mo himself said this was the most cost-effective plan, and that's why our government will keep going with it while maintaining our triple A credit rating, while maintaining the lowest debt to GDP ratio in the G7, and while maintaining historically low unemployment. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the house, we will always vote with Canadians and support them along the way. Thank you. She's got a terrible voice, guys. One of the worst. The member for Belchester is Jamalevi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. After eight years of this Prime Minister, we've suffered a passport crisis, an increase in violent crime, the doubling of rent costs, millions of people going to food banks, and criminals in our very homes. That's a great record. Quebecers are suffering because of this government's mismanagement, and now it's invading provincial jurisdictions. Will the Prime Minister listen to the Premier of Quebec, who is asking to finally mind his own business? The Honourable Minister for Public Services and Procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Six. Six affordable housing units. That's what the Leader of the Opposition built when he was Minister for Housing throughout Canada and throughout his mandate with the collaboration of the Government of Quebec and What's up, Hannah two Hannah flips? How are you today? Good to see you, man. 8,000 units will be built over the next few weeks. I would like to invite my colleague, the member for Béchelès Lille de Malévy, to uh, come with me to visit a building project in Lévy, where there will be 23 affordable housing units just for that unit and that project. The Honourable Member for Belchasse Légitime Lévy. To the already long list of failures of this Liberal government, we can add a total slackness in the management of public finances and the squandering of Quebec's money. The government spends Canadians' money indiscriminately. It has no budgetary discipline over the past eight years, and as a result, the, the debt is doubling. It has not balanced a budget, and then it wants to manage the province's affairs and lecture them. Quebec Premier François Legault is adamant that this federal government should finally mind its own business. Will the government listen to him, yes or no? The Honourable Leader of the Government in the House of Commons. Mr. Speaker, let us talk about a former Premier of Quebec, Mr. Charest, with whom this very member sat and voted for a pollution pricing system. And so I think that the hypocrisy from that side is rather striking, especially in a context where today we're talking about 400,000 potential jobs in Canada, thanks to green technology, thanks to our new economy. That member is against these kind of opportunities. Hey, Nicole, how are you? Good to see you. factories in Quebec, for example. On this side of the house, we, we have four Duke. opportunities for Quebec as a Welcome speaker. The channel. The and honorable member for day, Renata, Renata, how are you? The housing issue proves that the federal government must be prevented from interfering in Quebec's area of jurisdiction. When the federal government decides where the money goes, Quebecers get done dirty. CMHC figures prove it in black and white. Since the creation of the federal housing strategy in 2019, do you know, Mr. Speaker, how much of the funding Quebec has received? When is the federal government that chooses projects? 6.7%, Mr. Speaker. 6.7% isn't even a third of our fair share, Mr. Speaker. Will the government stop shortchanging Quebecers and transfer all the housing money unconditionally to Quebec? The Honourable Minister for Public Services and Procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let's, we've already talked about the six housing units of the Conservative leader. So now let's talk about the 8,000 affordable housing units, thanks to the leadership and the partnership between us and the province of Quebec and various municipalities in Quebec. The member for Salaberry sur roi in her riding, is no doubt aware of the Pédalo housing project with 48 accessible and affordable housing units that are adapted to climate change. That will bring real difference for dozens of people in her riding. I would be happy to go to that housing unit uh, project with her to show her how important our collaboration is with Quebec and for the people of her riding. The Honourable Member for Salaberry sur roi Quebecers constitute 20% of the population of Canada, and we receive 6.7% of federal investment in housing. When it's the federal government that chooses projects, so it doesn't need, you don't need to be a math whiz, Mr. Speaker, to figure out that we are being absolutely ripped off. Since 2019, the money has been used mainly to fund projects outside of Quebec. 
We are in the midst of a housing crisis, Mr. Speaker, and we are paying through our taxes to house Ontarians while we can no longer afford in Quebec to pay the rent here at home. Do you now understand, Mr. Speaker, why we need to keep the federal government as far away as, as possible from our exclusive jurisdiction over housing? The Honourable Minister for Public Services and Procurement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I understand that the Black Quebecois perhaps hey, Greg, doesn't appreciate hey, Serena, how are you guys doing? between Little the Quebec wolf, government and up? the federal government, but we've signed an agreement just a few weeks ago, an 8,000 affordable housing unit agreement, which is the biggest investment in affordable housing ever seen in Quebec, in all of Quebec's history. And that is because the government of Quebec and the federal government are working together in order to allow Quebecers and other and other Canadians access to affordable housing. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, Montreal has seen its highest rent increase in uh, 30 years. A true crisis that is preventing Montreal's from finding a roof under which to live. And what is the Liberal government's solution to this? To build only 35% of affordable and social housing units in the Wellington Basin. So. That means offering two-thirds of housing that is not affordable. Simple question. Why use public land to build housing that Quebecers cannot afford? The Honourable Minister for Public Services and Procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very happy to hear this question from my colleague. It shows once again the contrast that exists between this government and the previous government. In 2017, we implemented our first national strategy with regards to housing in our country's history, so that we can, which is a contrast to the Conservative leader who, when he was housing minister during his entire term and throughout the country, only built six affordable, Mr. Speaker, six affordable housing units. <laughs> The Honourable Member from London Fanshawe. The women and men in the Canadian Armed Forces have faced a military housing shortage for decades. Under Liberals and Conservatives, military housing has now been built and existing units are falling into disrepair. And now the Liberals want our Armed Forces to wait another two years before they even start building homes. This delay is unacceptable. Why is the Minister delaying building urgently needed homes for the men and women who serve our country? No, Jag, where are all the leaders today? Minister for National Defence. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and, and, and oh, making Lord, sure Bill that Blair, give me a break. Support, particularly for housing and child care, is, is absolutely essential for us to support the men and women who serve in Canadian Armed Forces. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, in our recently released defence policy, we've included a substantial investment of over $300 million to build housing. But, Mr. Speaker, that's that work has begun and will continue apace. And I look forward to working with all members of the Defence Committee as we bring forward important new initiatives to support the men and women of the Canadian Armed Forces. The Honourable Member from Regina Capel. Mr. Speaker, the Prime right. Minister is just not worth the cost, and now his carbon tax scheme is completely falling apart. First, his own budget watchdog proved conclusively that most Canadians are worse off even with the rebate. Then he was humiliated into granting a partial carve out because his Liberal MPs were sick of the backlash they were getting from their voters. And now a majority of Premiers are demanding an emergency carbon tax conference to put forward better ideas than his punishing tax. If he's so sure that his carbon tax is so good, then why does he, why does he just sit down and listen to the Premier? The Honourable Minister for Natural Resources and Energy. Mr. Speaker, later today we will be voting to advance the Sustainable Jobs Act. It is a critically important act in the context of growing an economy that will thrive in a low-carbon future. It will ensure that workers and environmental organizations have a seat at the table when we are discussing Canada's green economic plan. The Conservatives have obstructed at every turn, include in introducing 20,000 robo-amendments. We are building a strong economy for the future. The, con the Conservatives by, by contrast, are, are engaging in legislative vandalism. Before I, before I pass on the floor to the Honourable Member from Regina Capella, I'll ask all members, please only the members who do have, uh, who are recognized by the Speaker, to 
uh, to let their opinions be known. The Honourable Member from Regina Capel. Well, Mr. Speaker, none of that is true. But what is true is that yesterday, in a historic vote, a majority of MPs demanded that the Prime Minister sit down and just listen to the Premiers. It's baffling to understand why he's so afraid of meeting with them. It's not like they're going to ask him to put together IKEA furniture or help them move. They just want to put forward better ideas than hiking prices on everything. What is he so Pretty afraid entertaining of? Is it Doug? Is it Blaine? I know Scott Moe, Mr. Speaker. He's a really nice guy. Why doesn't the Prime Minister just meet with him? The Honourable Government House Leader. Oh, Lord McKinnon again. Mr. Speaker, Scott Moe said he sat down and poured over the data and could not possibly find a more effective way to combat, com combat GHG emissions than this government's policy on pricing pollution. You know, right now, today in this House, we are discussing untold, untold employment and economic opportunity for Canadians, including the people of Regina Capel. If he won't stand up for the workers at Regina Capel, we will, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Regina, Leuven. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'll invite the House Leader to come out to Regina and Scott Moe and I can have a beer and we can figure out what Scott really said about the carbon tax. Just last week, this Prime Minister raised the carbon tax by 23%. That increased the price of gas, groceries and home heating for all Canadians. Mr. Speaker, I am unsure of why this Prime Minister is so scared to meet with all the Premiers. Six, seven, eight Premiers want to meet with the Prime Minister and see what he has to say about his flagship carbon tax policy. Why won't he listen, or does he just not care? What's up, Kirk Morey? Good to see you, man. For women and gender equality. Hello, Mr. Someone, Speaker, someone. let's talk How about you? caring and young people, if we might, and affordability. Young people said they needed a break on interest and student loans. We did that. Kids getting out of school, home savings account, which 500,000 young people now have, so they can save towards their first home. And now rent payments will build rental history, credit history, because when you pay rent, it should count. Mr. Speaker, young people have asked, we have answered. The question is, what do you have to say? What are you gonna cut? Are you gonna cut these measures? The Honourable Member, I'm sorry, thank you for reminding me, uh, members, that I, all questions should come through the chair and not directly to Lord, other members. Sit down, the Greg. The member from Regina Leuven. One of the first things we're going to cut is about 70 or 80 Liberal MPs. Oh my goodness, good line. And secondly, 9 out of 10 young Canadians believe they'll never own a home under this government. It's embarrassing, Mr. Speaker. Canadians used to be able to pay off a home in 25 years. Now it takes 25 years to save to even afford a down payment. This Prime Minister refuses to listen to our Premiers. If he's so proud of his carbon tax, will the coward of the county come out of his house and actually meet with Premiers? Interesting. Miss Mythical Gestures, good day, how are you? Uh, I'd like to remind Gesture. all members uh, to... Uh, hey Wolverine, how are you? Sit down, Fergus. As the Speaker Come has, uh, has uh, made this point before, it's important not to call into question uh, any member's uh, courage. The Honourable Minister for Seniors, at, uh, Labour and Seniors. I think, I think, Mr. Speaker, on this, on this issue, it is very important to list the constituents. I'd like to quote Danielle from Foothills. She said, I do my family's taxes, so I know we got $850. We get an extra little bump for me and my husband because we live in a rural environment. And when I go back and I look at what I spent last year in carbon taxes because I was working from home, I wasn't commuting, my gas bills were way down, and even the amount of tax that I paid on my home heating bills were principally natural gas for where I live. I would say that I probably ended up better off with that transfer. You should listen to constituents like Danielle of Foothills, Alberta. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Megantic Clérable. The Prime Minister has spent the last two weeks uh, reminding Canadians of the disasters he has caused over the last eight years. Passports, immigration, late job insurance payments, uh, inflation, interest rates, and of course the doubling of rent costs. And the list is very long. And yesterday his Liberal members voted against the Conservative motion that was adopted by this House to uh, have a meeting with all Premiers 
The last meeting was in 2016. Will he or will he not call this meeting? Or does he prefer to continue destroying everything through interference without consulting the provinces? What is he scared of? The Honourable Minister for Innovation. On this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, and um, we act. On the other hand, Canadians hear that there is absolutely no action. And no action or inaction is not a strategy. Inaction is not a plan. Inaction is not an option, Mr. Speaker. On this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we have a plan for Canadians. We will invest in a greater number of housing units. We will invest in childcare, Mr. Speaker. We will invest in jobs. We will invest in growth. Mr. Speaker, we'll let them create their slogans while we will continue to actually work for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Miganti Clérable. After eight years of this government, let us talk about its record, Mr. Speaker. Housing costs have doubled. Immigration waiting times are never ending. Over 800,000 Quebecers are using food banks every single month. Our streets are less and less safe. Violent crime is on the up. And bad news, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister now wants to impose his incompetence on the provinces. It's like giving the key to our house to the very vandals who have just ransacked it. Will the Prime Minister finally admit that he has absolutely no skill in managing his own government and that he should, for once, mind his own business? The Honourable Minister for the Environment and Climate Change. Mr. Speaker, we could talk about vandals, but let us talk about climate vandals who are just on the other side of the House, Mr. Speaker. The member on the other side wants to know what the benefit of carbon pricing is. It's not difficult. All he has to do is look and speak to the member right behind him, who was part of the very first government in North America to price carbon, because it's the right thing to do, Mr. Speaker. It's the right thing to do for the economy. It's the right thing to do in fighting climate change. It's the right thing to do for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. The Minister for Immigration, Christine Fréchette, reiterated the Quebec government's minimum demands. Nothing spectacular, no exaggerations. She's not asking for full powers in immigration, just the bare minimum. Fair distribution of asylum seekers between the provinces. Reimbursement, reimbursement of reception costs and adequate funding for francisation. I don't think that's not too much to ask. Will the government respond positively to Quebec's demands, or will we end up with yet another liberal squabble? Because they seem to love that. The Honourable Minister for Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship. Mr. Speaker, what I've agreed uh, Mark with Miller. Minister Fréchette when I met her two weeks ago Lord. would be that we would use our full powers in our respective fields of jurisdiction under the Canada-Quebec Agreement in a reasonable and reasoned way. That is what I ex expect to do with her over the next few months. Canadians and Quebecers will benefit from this. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, the discussions are going so well that the Quebec government is thinking of holding a referendum on immigration. The truth is that Quebec, uh, that Quebec is so fed up of being laughed in the face by this government that it is thinking of talk, turning to the people. And given the federal government's incompetence in managing its responsibilities, we all know that things would go a lot better if Quebec had full powers. Will the minister respond to Minister Frichette's very reasonable requests, or would he prefer to wait for the entire population hey, of Quebec Goldie, to express hey, his views Devlin, on this federal up? government's incompetence when it comes to immigration? The Honourable Minister for Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, and Mr. Speaker, there's not a country in the world that would give full powers to someone else. What I have agreed upon with Minister Fréchette is that we would follow our respective responsibilities in our respective fields of jurisdiction to best serve Quebecers, and that's I will do, and that's what the Minister will do as well. The Honourable Member for Drummond. The French Prime Minister is visiting Canada and Quebec. We all know the uh, special ties that Quebec has with this great country, the cradle of human rights and secularism. At a time when monarchists are proudly singing God Save the King, when the tragic history of Acadians is being trampled underfoot, I believe there is an opportunity to remind France that we still share some democratic values. Will the government undertake not to contribute in any way, either directly or indirectly, to the challenge to Bill 21 on the sexual What's nature, up, Steve? Steve? nature rather, of nice the Quebec state? Welcome to the channel. The Honourable Minister for Justice. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Speaker. As I have already mentioned a number of times, as has already been mentioned by the Prime Minister himself, with the current situation with Bill 21, 
when the situation reaches the Supreme Court, were it to arrive to the Supreme Court, we'll be here to intervene to defend the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and to defend rights like the right to free speech, the right to equality and religious rights. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Speaker, after eight years okay. of this NDP Liberal government, this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. But don't take my word for it. Heather from Newbury writes, people need the cost of living brought under control now. And Carol from Strathroy says, one more tax will take us down. We're already struggling. To the average Canadian, the cost of the carbon tax on gas, groceries, home heating, farmers and families is punishing, not progress. So will the Prime Minister axe the tax on farmers and help make food cheaper by passing Bill C-234 in its original form. The Honourable Minister for Labour and Seniors. All right, I thank the uh, Honourable Member for that question. And I, I would allow Danielle from Foothills to continue with her comments. She also added, I would say that I probably better ended, off, ended up better off with that transfer. She also said, and so I think a lot of people would be of that view that if you are going to implement some kind of revenue-neutral carbon pricing, that's probably not a bad way of doing it. Now, these are the words of Danielle from, from Foothills. I'm happy to inform Danielle that two and a half years later, since she made that comment, it is now up to $1,800 for a family of four in Alberta. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Well, Mr. Speaker, even the NDP Liberal Environment Chair admitted that the carbon tax has no impact on climate change. Hmm. And yet, just last week, the Prime Minister increased the carbon tax by 23%, driving up the cost of gas, groceries, and home heating. If farmers cannot afford to grow food, you have failed as a government. And let me remind everyone, no farms, no food. So will the Prime Minister help bring the cost of food down for Canadians, ax the tax on farmers, and pass the C234 in the Honourable Government House Leader. Speaker, instead of opposing battery plants, instead of standing up against sustainable jobs, that member and her caucus should remember that farmers have the vast majority of the fuels they use, which are tax exempt uh, right. under the pollution pricing strategy. Farmers in this country are supported uh, big time by adjustment policies because they know more than anyone that climate change is a reality. And with respect to Bill C-234, that member should walk down to the front bench and tell her government, tell her opposition House Leader that he should call Bill 234 and we'll resolve it. Here, here. The Honourable Member from Dauphin, Swan River, Nipawa. This NDP Liberal government is just not worth the cost. Last week, the Prime Minister increased the carbon tax by 23%, driving up the cost of gas, groceries and home heating. But on Tuesday, the Liberal Environment Chair revealed no, there is no proof the carbon tax reduces emissions. Quote, there is no data specifically stating the price on carbon resulted in an X amount of reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. End quote. Now that, the, now that the carbon tax scam has been exposed by a Liberal, will the Prime Minister finally axe the tax? The Honourable Minister for Energy and sorry, Thank you. For Natural Speaker, Resources and Energy. We on this side of the House are focused on making life more affordable for Canadians, but also on fighting climate change. The, the PBO and 200 economists across this country have been very clear. Eight out of ten Canadian families get more money back. It works disproportionate to income. Even the Conservatives actually used to know this before they got collective amnesia. Every one of the members on that side of the House ran in 2021 on a promise to put in place carbon pollution. The hypocrisy that comes from that side of the House is unbelievable. I don't know. I don't know what to say. The Honourable Member from Nunavut. First Nations and Inuit have been neglected by successive Liberal and Conservative governments for years. They have underfunded infrastructure for First Nations by $350 billion. Wow. For Inuit, the gap is $75 billion more. The Liberals committed to closing this gap by 2030, but they are nowhere near their target. This means no more. This means more moldy homes, more crumbling schools, and more contaminated water. When will the Liberals fulfill their obligations to First Nations and Inuit by closing this infrastructure gap? Good 
Hey Jody, how are you? Good to see you. Backyard Garden, good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for that very important question Look and for the advocacy in this House. We thank the Assembly of First Nations for their partnership. We actually worked together with them on this report, and we welcome the important recommendations that it brought forward. We know that decades of underinvestment and discrimination have led to this infrastructure deficit, which is indeed a crisis for Indigenous peoples across this country. Our government has put a stop to this with record investments by dramatically increasing up to 1,100 per cent since 2016. We are taking action to close that infrastructure gap, and we will not stop until it is done. The Honourable Member from Skeena, Bulkley Valley. Mr. Speaker, there are many residential school survivors and family members of murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls in British Columbia who are non-status. And this week, they're learning that their access to counselling is being cut off because the Liberals, like the Conservatives before them, are underfunding First Nations health. These are community members who've experienced serious trauma and for whom counselling is a key part of their healing journey. Why is this government denying survivors access to critical counselling? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Crown and Indigenous Relations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for that very important question. Violence against Indigenous women, girls, two-spirit and gender diverse people must be put to an end, Mr. Speaker. After the previous government dragged their feet for years, we called a national inquiry. We have an action plan that is co-developed with Indigenous partners. We made progress. For example, we built uh, 12 new cell towers along the Highway of Tears in British Columbia. New shelters for Indigenous women, supporting frontline Indigenous victim services. What's up, Bob Boone? How are you doing? Kalamaru, good day, sir. And we will continue to do more. The Honourable Member from I was going to say, Mr. Pickles. pickles. I like pickles. Mr. Speaker, Canadians know better than to trust Conservatives' failed policies. On this side of the House, mm. our government is focused on creating more good jobs, including in innovation and technology. Last week, in my riding of Kitchener South Hespler, I was pleased to be with our government when we announced new measures from the upcoming Budget 2024 to secure Canada's AI advantage. Mr. Speaker, can the President of the Treasury Board please update this House on our government's announcement on AI? Good question. The Honourable um, President of the Treasury Board. Mr. Speaker, oh, I thank Lord. the Honourable Member for her hard work. Last week, our government announced $2.4 billion to, to support to artificial intelligence across this country. That means more infrastructure for AI researchers. That means more innovative AI solutions for small and medium-sized businesses. That means the creation of an AI institute. And that means the responsible use of AI across the country. Unlike the Conservatives who deny science, we will always support an innovative economy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Liberal government, life is more expensive and Quebecers are paying the price. Housing costs have doubled and lineups at food banks are longer than ever. Quebecers are struggling to feed themselves, and it's because of this Prime Minister's insistence on interfering in provincial jurisdictions. It's obvious this Liberal government isn't worth the cost. Will the Prime Minister finally withdraw from provincial jurisdictions so that Quebec can undo the damage? The Honourable Minister for Innovation. We will take no lessons we from the Conservatives. We will take no lessons. He has one line. We've created more housing in this country. We have a plan. We have a plan to create prosperity. What do we have on the other side is slogans. People at home know that slogans don't create housing, slogans don't create jobs, and slogans don't create prosperity. On this side of the House, we're going to focus on issues that matter to Canadians and let Conservatives invent more slogans. Canadians know what side they're on and we're with them. The Honourable Member from Mamengik. Eight years of this Liberal government has given us a broken immigration system, an unsustainable cost of living, sky-high crime rates, and millions of Canadians who are suffering. This Prime Minister causes problems in every area of Canadian life, and he's also intruding on provincial jurisdictions. Quebecers have clearly understood. This Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Can the Prime Minister stop spreading his incompetence and just mind his own business? 
No, no, Hi, Minister. The Honorable Minister for Public Services and okay, Procurement. Okay, do close is going to be Thank real you, creepy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let's take a closer Mind look at how creepy this Minding our business means investing in daycare and housing and high-speed internet. It's also about investing so that the children in the riding of my colleague have their bellies full. We announced an investment that's going to help 400,000 children, hundreds of which live in his riding, to go to school with full bellies so that they can learn and develop to their full potential. Unfortunately, they're going to vote against it when the budget is tabled. After eight long years, the Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Food banks no longer meet demand. The cost of rents and mortgages doubled. The dream of first home ownership is nearly impossible for our young people. For eight years, it's invaded provincial jurisdictions, and Quebecers' quality of life is worse. Instead of imposing his incompetence on the province, could he please just mind his own business? The Honourable Leader of the Government. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, this member, like all Conservative MPs in Quebec, I would like them to talk to their leader because they're getting in the way of 400,000 possible jobs thanks to green technology. Like in Quebec, the battery plant will create thousands of jobs. This member knows full well that Quebec will prosper in a green economy. They should inform their leader and stop getting in the way of progress. The Honourable Member for Chicoutimi-Lefia. Mr. Speaker, we just have to think of Arrive Can, borders, passports, unemployment insurance, the deficit. Everything hey, secrets, is going what's wrong. up? How are you? Good day, Derek. After eight years, Mr. Holstrom, this Prime Minister up? has turned to failure everything that he has touched. He's insulting Quebecers even more by interfering in their areas of jurisdiction. Can the Prime Minister mind his own business and let Quebec make its own decisions? The Honourable Minister for Innovation. I think my colleague has amnesia because our government is the one that made the most significant investment in the history of Quebec. North Volt is an investment that's going to build for this generation and the next. As we do this, we're investing in daycares. We're investing in housing. We're investing in mental health. We're investing in Canadians. We're investing in prosperity. We're investing in Canada. We're investing in Can uh, Canadians, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to do so. This is a long the government is not helping to solve the housing crisis. It's dragging it out even um, longer. Talk. Ottawa could just transfer be money for housing to Anyways. Quebec. But the Liberals it'll, have it'll, instead it'll chosen around. to impose conditions on the infrastructure program, supposedly to force provinces to build housing faster. But the result of all this is that in addition to slowing down building construction, Ottawa's paralyzing construction of infrastructure. They want to see doorknobs before setting up running water. Does the minister realize that his plan is putting the cart before the horse? The Honourable Minister for Public Services and Procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the member is right to highlight the importance of investing in infrastructure, in drinking water, in wastewater treatment. We announced $6 billion an additional $6 billion to support municipalities to help build infrastructure that will help us in Quebec and elsewhere to build the 8,000 units we've already planned with the government of Quebec, whose leadership is essential. It's a contrast with the six housing units that uh, the previous Conservative leader achieved when he was in government. Les, les patriotes the Liberals are shameless. Instead of making themselves useful, they've decided to be contemptuous and blackmail us with our own money, just like the Conservatives did back in the day. It's not surprising, given the recent announcement. Quebec's housing minister made it clear that there's no question of Quebec agreeing to a number of conditions to get its fair share. Quebec's cities don't belong to Ottawa. Can the minister commit to guarantee Quebec its right to withdraw with full compensation and no strings? The Honourable Minister 
for Public Services and Procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member is right to talk about that the Conservative leader is insulting. He insulted Quebec's municipalities, including the people in the city of Quebec. It is pretty funny, Dive Crew Canada. We announced... Um. With the leadership of the City of Quebec, the construction do? of 324 affordable housing units. 324 is 50 times more than all of the housing units created by the Conservative leader when he was the Minister of Housing. The Honourable Member from Fort McMurray, Cold Lake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. After eight years, Canadians are struggling to make ends meet due to the Liberal NDP's crippling carbon taxes. They're all economic pain and no environmental gain. Just last week, the Prime Minister increased the carbon tax by 23 percent, further driving up the cost of gas, groceries and home heating. The least they could do is take the carbon tax off the farmers who feed us, which would in turn lower the cost of food. So my question is simple. Will the Prime Minister axe the tax on farmers and make food cheaper for Canadians by passing Bill C-234 in its original form? Great question. The Honourable Government House Leader. Bill C-234 was here, then it went to the Senate. Conservative senators threatened a bunch of other senators who wanted to debate the bill. The bill is now back in this House, and it is completely up to the leader. Ah, oh, Lord, yeah. He's up there talking crap. No wonder they're getting wound up. The Honourable Minister has 20 seconds left on the clock. Senators. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's rather impolite to interrupt the people answering questions, as the members across know. Bill C-234, put very simply, can be brought to the floor of this House on the simple whim of the Leader of the Opposition. That member should actually talk to him. That's a good idea. Good day, Chris Flood. How are you doing, man? What's up? Welcome After eight years of this NDP Liberal government, Canadians are well versed in their corruption. Sadly, it's worse. Bombshell testimony on Beijing's interference in Canadian elections. A senior Liberal disclosed top secret information to the then Liberal MP from Don Valley North that he was being watched by CSIS. Wow. This was a despicable breach of national security for Liberal partisan gain. And only very high ranking Liberals would have access to this. A cabinet minister or a senior Liberal. Who is the person? Give us this Liberal name. Dirty. They're all dirty. You hear what Kuti said? That was pretty funny. For public safety. Mr. Speaker, we worked collaboratively with all the opposition parties last summer to set up an independent judicial inquiry into foreign interference. We've seen a number of weeks of public testimony, including this week. We didn't think, Mr. Speaker, in the terms of reference, we had to put a line that would say we should have the basic respect for the integrity and independence of the commission process, not to comment on every day's appearances, but to let the justice do her work. And we look forward to her report in this important issue. Well done. The Honourable Member from Gufford Caledon. There's no decency or respect when a senior Liberal, either a cabinet minister or a senior Liberal staffer, disclose top secret CSIS information for Liberal gain. It's, it's despicable. It gets He's worse. He's got a funny voice, this right? This compromised CSIS work. It put Liberal partisan gain over national security. And the Prime Minister must have known. When did the Prime Minister find out? When did he call in the RCMP to investigate, or were the briefing documents just a bit too long so he didn't read them? The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Again, Mr. Speaker, my colleague can, re my colleague can repeat a series of allegations. We don't think that this is particularly constructive when a senior Court of Appeal Justice is seized with this very matter, which is here, she is hearing evidence from witnesses and interviewing in camera all of the relevant officials, receiving all of the most classified documents. Why doesn't my honorable friend allow her to do this work and not continually repeat and interfere in the middle of her hearings? The law is getting cranky. It's honorable just about members, happy hour time. Please encourage you to listen to the person who is recognized to have the floor. The Honorable Member, Donna Deputy de Sudbury. Canada continues to support Ukraine. We've provided military support and aid. 
we're working with our allies and our partners all throughout the world. However, we must recall that this is not the first time Russia has behaved like an aggressor towards Ukraine. Can the Minister of Foreign Affairs reaffirm our long-term commitment to Ukraine? Then I have minister. The Honourable Minister for Global Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to mm. thank my colleague for her important question because Ukrainians are on the front line of democracy. They're fighting for their freedom and ours. I don't Putin know what to say, has guys. No red like, line. If he wins in Ukraine, he'll keep going. That's why no we have to support is, uh, Ukraine for our security simpleton. and that of the world. That's why we concluded a new agreement, a $3 billion agreement for its long-term security. We've been there from the beginning, and we will continue to, to be, for their, be there for them even after they achieve victory. The Honourable Member from Carlton Trail, Eagle Creek. After eight years of this NDP Liberal government, we see historic levels of corruption. Conservatives have uncovered a tangled web of chaos, collusion and cover-ups in the Arrive Scam scandal. Just the latest example of Liberal insiders getting rich. GC Strategies opened its doors when this Prime Minister took office. This place will make history when it summons GC Strategies to the bar to answer our questions. Why did the Prime Minister make these gamsters multi-millionaires? Yeah. 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 How are you? Minister for Public Safety. Again, Mr. Speaker, because our colleague repeats something doesn't make it factual, she knows very well, Mr. Speaker, that the Auditor General has looked into these matters. We've welcomed parliamentary committee review. People have been available, including senior government officials, to go before parliamentary committee. Oh, too rowdy in the house for old Greg Fergus, I guess. Had to hit his button. What's going on here, guys? What is he doing? Ask, uh, all members, please, to uh, Goodness gracious. restrain themselves. Come on. Uh, there were a couple of very large uh, or loud interventions while the minister was speaking. It's hard for me to hear the, the answer. Sometimes difficult for me to uh, hear the question. I ask all members, and I know I could identify the members, but they're honourable members. I ask them, please, to hold their comments back. The honourable minister has 20 seconds left on the clock. So. Mr. Speaker, as I was saying, the Canadian Border Services Agency is conducting internal reviews on this matter. The RCMP are also looking into these questions. We have said that anybody who has misused or abused taxpayers' funds will be held accountable, and we look forward to these processes coming to their conclusion. The Honourable Member from Brantford Brant. Mr. Speaker, this Prime Minister is not worth the cost oh, or corruption. Right. In the past year, this government spent over $21 billion on outside consultants. Rather than helping struggling Canadians, he's focused on making Liberal insiders richer. It's no shock that the Liberal favoured GC Strategies, who pocketed $20 million for doing nothing on the Rive scam, was founded the same year that he took office. Shame. Will this Prime Minister commit to cutting all waste and corruption in the upcoming budget, or will he continue to get more Liberal insiders rich? Here, here, here. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, as my colleague knows, the Minister of Public Services and Procurement, the President of the Treasury Board, myself as Minister responsible for the Border Services Agency, have already taken steps to reduce reliance on outside consultants. Mr. Speaker, we've reviewed and changed the process for approving these kind of contracts. We'll continue to look at everything necessary to ensure that taxpayers' money is well spent. And those people that are responsible for these decisions know that they'll be held accountable in the case of misuse or abuse. The Honourable Member from Brantford Brent. I hope the government holds itself accountable. The Arise scam merely scratches the surface of the rot and corruption in this NDP Liberal government. Their procurement system is seriously flawed and broken. For example, they paid KPMG, a consulting company, almost 700,000 taxpayer dollars to learn how to cut back on consultants. Oh. You can't make up this lunacy. They Doesn't learn nothing. Sense. The question is simple. In the budget next week, will we see a cut to all the corruption? The Honourable Minister for Public Works. Well, too close is going to Thank try you, to Mr. creep Speaker, them out. As our colleague, the Minister of Public Safety, has said repeatedly, repeating falsehoods doesn't make those falsehoods true. 
What they should know, however, is that the Auditor General did table an important report just a few weeks ago, which found that rules were not followed by a few public servants. Fortunately, many of these rules have been updated, mm -hmm. and regulations and expectations around the use of those rules have been clearly commu uh, communicated to all relevant public servants. The Honorable Member from Vaughan Woodbridge. Workers in Vaughan Woodbridge and across the country have been clear, Mr. Speaker. The Sustainable Jobs Act what up, is critical Mikey. How are you? ensuring they have the tools and skills they need to build up our net zero future. From greener buildings to electric vehicles to clean energy. The tens of thousands of conservative amendments on this legislation are designed to block this bill and block workers from getting a seat at the table. Can the Minister of Energy tell this House why are we here, why are we here fighting for workers today? The Honourable Minister for, Nat for Natural Resources and Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today we are in this House fighting for workers and communities in Canada so we can create sustainable jobs moving forward, we will grow the economy, and we will fight climate change. Standing in the way of workers is the Conservative leader, a proud supporter of notorious anti-worker legislation, including Bill C-377 and 525. His plan for Canada is to cut investments, to let our economy fall behind, and to let the planet burn. Our plan will ensure we are building an economy where Canadian workers and Canadian communities will win, and we will vote as many times as it takes to get it done. The Honourable Member from Edmonton, Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, today I met with Mansour oh. Schumann, a Palestinian Canadian who has a risked bad voice his too. life to report on the devastation and horror of the war in Gaza. Weeks ago, the Liberals promised to stop selling military goods to Netanyahu and to sanction extremists. As innocent children continue to die, they haven't issued export notices or announced sanctions. This is a betrayal of the hundreds of thousands of Canadians who want peace for Palestinians and Israelis. We need a two-way arms embargo and sanctions. How many more people will die before this government acts? Here, here. So unpleasant. The Honourable Minister for Global Affairs. Oh, no. I would like to say that I've yeah. talked to the mother of Mansour Schumann many Check out times. The Adam's apple. He was obviously struggling in Gaza, and we made sure that he could come safely back home, working with the Minister of Immigration on this very issue. Uh, second, on the question of Israel, Hamas and the war, of course we know that uh, the situation in Gaza is completely catastrophic. Uh, the violence must stop. We need a ceasefire now. We need to make sure that hostages are released. We need humanitarian aid going in. And the, 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 my colleague already knows when it comes to arms, we have not sent arms. The Honourable Member from Kitchener Centre. Mr. Speaker, it's been two years since this government committed $1.5 billion to build co-op housing across the country. Yet two years later, instead of returning to annual predictable investments in deeply affordable co-op housing, this one-time program hasn't even launched. Instead, last week we heard more announcements while thousands of shovel-ready co-op projects are still waiting. What's the point of making announcements if they're not going to spend the money? And when will the minister commit to these much-needed co-ops homes getting built? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Housing, Infrastructure Speaker, and Communities. Whether it's co-op housing, oh, whether no. it's missing middle housing, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, mid-rise apartments. Terrible. That is the focus of this government, building yeah. more, dealing with that crisis in supply. This is what this government is seized with. In fact, I recently met with the federation responsible for co-op housing and its advocacy in this country. They remarked how happy they were with the progress that's been made. Of course, there's more to do, but lifting the GST off of that type of construction is something that I point to the member as well. There's a larger context here, uh, here as well to pay attention to. We're getting it done. We're getting that work done. We're going to see more building. Excellent. I got and a feeling comes to around wrap. another question period. I'm now ready to rule on the question. All right. Well, so let's take a peek over here. Uh, yeah, that's going to wrap it up for today. Um, it was fun. There's a lot of people watching. That Poliev speech at the beginning was very interesting. I know that uh, he's been doing a lot of speeches lately, but that one was written uh, better than the other speeches. It was less uh, formula. 
somebody somebody must have let him know that the speeches were becoming repetitive because it seemed to be discussing a lot more more deeply the, the platforms that he has for the changes that he's going to make when he's our next prime minister, which the polls say that's going to happen with a big majority. So like uh, between now and then, some things could change. But again, I don't know. I pay attention to a lot of politics. It would seem that these liberals are sticking to their guns and about 70% of Canadians don't want that. So uh, that's probably going to change uh, by the next election. Anyways, guys, I'm Aaron. This is Question Period Canada. We're here daily. We watch every Question Period um, and other videos, some shorts, stuff like that. Like, subscribe, get notified, share it with somebody if you could. That'd be great. Anyways, I appreciate everybody coming and watching, hanging out. It's fun. And we're going to go for now. Got to get something to eat. And I also have to use the washroom. So we're going to skip. Thank you all for tuning in. We'll catch you tomorrow. Uh, starts earlier tomorrow. We're, we're a couple hours early tomorrow. It's always earlier on Fridays. It, that's their schedule, not mine. So, uh, yeah, come check us out tomorrow, a couple hours earlier than you did today. And we'll be here, have something. Well, there will be a question period. And the Fridays can be wacky sometimes because uh, it's a lot of the backbenchers and people that don't get a lot of time on the parliament floor are speaking on Fridays. Sort of a... Uh, Trudeau's hooky day, I guess. One, one, of, one of the three hooky days he has during the five-day work week. Anyhow, we're out. Thank you all. We'll catch you next video. I've got to run. We'll catch you next time.